It's North Korea's founding anniversary today, one of the most celebrated days in the North. <laughs> The South Korean military is monitoring activities north of the border for any possible signs of a provocation. The South Korean government hinted this week at the possibility of another ballistic missile launch today to mark the anniversary, as the regime often conducts major provocations to coincide with important anniversaries. Military officials say no signs have been detected yet to suggest a missile launch or another act of aggression. Officials say North Korea could choose October 10th, the founding anniversary of the ruling Workers' Party, to conduct another provocation. That is said he was aware of reports that North Korea could be preparing to test fire another ICBM on Saturday to mark the regime's founding anniversary. And that could come at Saturday Korean time, and it could be a flatter trajectory launch that would put it deeper into the Pacific, more threatening to the United States. Asked whether the U.S. would take military action. In response to another provocation, Mattis said he never speculates on such situations, but stressed South Korea and the U.S. are tied together by an unbreakable bond. Here in South Korea, the military at least seems to be on wartime footing. The South Korean forces wrapping up exercises that we've been tracking all this week following last weekend's nuclear test by North Korea. There are more, we are told, next week involving the U.S. Marine. A small trace of radioactive material believed to stem from North Korea's latest nuclear test has been detected in the South. After analyzing soil, water and air samples, the nation's nuclear safety agency detected 0.43 millibacarels per cubic meter of xenon-133. The findings come five days after the regime carried out its strongest nuke test to date on Sunday. Conclusions on whether the radioactive material has any relations to that event will be made after tracking down the inflow of the material and analyzing samples collected from mobile capture equipment. The agency adds the small trace will not have any negative impact on local residents and the country's background radiation remains at the usual level of 50 to 300 nanosieverts per hour. Heated rhetoric between the United States and North Korea is raising concern in much of the world that a major conflict is looming. But in South Korea, it is the background noise of life. Separated by the most heavily militarized border in the world, most South Koreans have lived under the risk of war for a long time. Pyongyang has repeatedly threatened to turn the South Korean capital Seoul into, quote, a sea of fire and has thousands of artillery units in place along the border to do it.
our attention to the continued international efforts to rein in the out-of-control regime. The United States is pushing for the strongest sanctions yet against Pyongyang. It includes an oil embargo targeting North Korean smuggling boats and blacklisting the Hermit Kingdom's leader himself. Connie Kim outlines the latest punitive measures for us. Each of the previous United Nations Security Council resolutions on North Korea had been dubbed the most powerful sanctions on the reclusive regime. But every time they have been adopted, they fail to be effective. And this time, the U.S. is not backing down and is seeking to close every possible loophole in its efforts to put a break on Pyongyang's ever-growing nuclear ambitions. The circulated draft resolution at the United Nations states the Council would empower the U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force to intercept North Korean ships at sea and inspect them to check if they are carrying weapons, material or fuel into the regime. The first set of sanctions also includes blacklisting Kim Jong-un for the first time. This means a freeze on his foreign assets and virtually all the assets of the regime's military and sole political party, as well as a travel ban on the North Korean leader. The biggest restriction in the new sanctions would ban the sale of oil, refined petroleum products and natural gas to the north. China and Russia have long been against this idea as cutting down on Beijing's supplies of 500,000 tons of crude oil and 200,000 tons of oil products would be enough to destabilize the regime. Banning the North's textiles exports, its second biggest export product last year, is also reportedly on the draft resolution, in addition to imposing a complete ban on hiring North Korean workers abroad. While the range of sanctions has been expanded, a new UN report alleges that the UN member nations lacks enforcement and North Korea's evolving techniques to evade sanctions are undermining UN efforts to coerce Pyongyang to abandon its nuclear weapons. In figures, $270 million have gone into the regime since the end of last year from exports of banned minerals, coal, iron and zinc. The U.S. is pushing to put the draft resolution to a vote on Monday. But whether it will be adopted remains a question as veto-wielding China and Russia have reportedly not shown support for the draft. At the Russian port of Vladivostok, the third Eastern Economic Forum, which kicked off Wednesday, has come to a close. The annual forum was launched in 2015 to help develop the eastern part of Russia. The Eastern Economic Forum is part of Russian President Putin's New East policy, outlined in 2012, to attract more investment in the Russian Far East. This region is underdeveloped and has a small population. But with its abundant gas reserves and marine resources, it has enormous value and investment potential. According to the EEF, 27 percent of gas reserves and 17 percent of oil reserves in the Asia-Pacific region are concentrated in the Russian Far East, but the level of development of known oil and gas deposits is still low at around 12 percent. Putin sees the Russian Far East as the country's new growth engine and a strategic region that could connect Russia to the Asia-Pacific. Since 2014, Russia saw zero to negative economic growth due to international sanctions and a drop in oil prices. But the Russian Far East region saw around 5 percent annual economic growth, showing just how much is being invested in the region. But to further develop its chemical and petrochemical industry, Russia needs technology and infrastructure development, which is why Russia has been inviting leaders from the Asia-Pacific, like the South Korean President Moon Jae-in and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, to its annual forum. At his keynote speech, President Moon outlined nine key areas of cooperation, including shipbuilding, railways, ports, agriculture and seafood. Given the North's provocations, railroad projects like Najin Hassan are unfeasible for now, so carrying out small yet feasible projects is key. South Korea has top-notch shipbuilding skills. It can help Russia build ships, containers and logistics infrastructure, while we can import natural gas in line with the government's plan to shift away from nuclear energy. Experts say Korea and Russia's economies are complementary, meaning there's room to expand exports and imports. Korean businesses can benefit from Russia's energy and its original technology, while Korea can in turn help build Russia's infrastructure and logistics through its applied technology. For Russia, Korea is the best partner in the region. Unlike Japan and China, Korea hasn't had any major wars or conflicts with Russia. China and Russia are close partners, but Russia is always on guard against China's rapid rise. To boost cooperation with Russia, experts say the formation of the Presidential Committee on Economic Cooperation with Northern Countries is a good move. 
Having a committee specializing in Russian Far East development would make two-way cooperation more efficient. The next step is to build trust by reviewing and carrying our existing cooperation projects and have more Russian experts at the Blue House to enhance mutual understanding. According to the EEF, more than 200 agreements worth 32 billion U.S. dollars were signed last year, but many of them haven't yet entered the practical stage. Actual implementation of projects is not easy due to Russia's lack of global financing standards and sanctions that make private investment difficult. Government support in public-private partnerships would be important to help Korean businesses invest in the region and protect their interests. The Asia-Pacific region is emerging as a strategic hub in the 21st century with China, India and Russia all pushing for initiatives to integrate the region economically. President Moon's look north for development policy is Korea's initiative to connect the Asia-Pacific. But all this marks just the beginning to actually carry out the projects in a feasible manner, details